Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday night version of Wine Press. Day number of quarantine. I don't know. They're all kind of running together for me now. How about you? My kids told me the other day, I said, Daddy, what day is this? <laughs> I think it's Thursday. I said, it is hard to track time without us regularly going to church. So make this part of your, your, your weekly routine. If you want to be ready for church when we start back, then at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, uh, be ready. Uh, get yourself ready and, and be ready. Um, <clears throat> and get your Bible and your notebook and set up and be ready for this Bible study together. Tonight's going to be especially interesting because we've got to go into a lot of astronomy. We're going to kind of explain what John is seeing in the sky. He's seeing through the Jewish calendar. And we're going to show you why he's doing that and talk about that in a few minutes. But first, let's open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our study time together tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into people's lives right now. The opportunity to come into their homes and to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is not a book of fear. Rather, it is a book of, of, of the wrapping up, the conclusion of all the promises and all the prophecies. It's during this book, Father, that we see the bride of Christ, her value to God, and her returning home for the wonderful wedding celebration. And in the middle of that, Lord, because you love us, you're also showing us what's going to happen for those who miss the wedding. And you don't do that as a point of fear. Because throughout this book you show your unrelenting mercy. And your compassion. Also Father you inspire us the believers. To want to reach out and share the love of Christ with even more. Even more. So help us God as we read and study to not be fearful. Because you didn't give us a spirit of fear. But rather power, love and a sound mind. Help us, Father, to instead see the need and the drawing to share the love of Christ with everyone we meet, especially during this time of quarantine. It allows us closer connection with our neighbors in our neighborhood. Help us, Father God, and let this thing pass quickly. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start tonight um, in Revelation chapter 12. And chapter 12 opens us up to a whole different world of John's vision. But before we do that, let's check some breaking news from around the world. I pulled up three or four articles this week that I thought were very interesting, not just in light of what we're going to study tonight, but in light of some things we've already studied that bring a few things into focus for you, okay? So let's start, let's start here if we can, okay? You know how the United States has responded to the coronavirus outbreak. And compared to the rest of the world, I know they're saying that we have surpassed the world in the number <clears throat> of infected people. However, I'm also being told from missionary friends that are in China that the Chinese government is not telling the truth about the numbers. They're, they're just not. They're not publishing that. They don't want that to be seen. And several other countries are not being honest about their numbers as well. They want to appear to be stronger than what they are. Even in the U.S., we may not be publishing all the numbers correctly. So, but in light of that, in light of how you've seen our president and administration pull through our organization, the response to this thing together, the former 10th president of the European Union was quoted uh, yesterday uh, as saying this, he said, um, this is like a war, but the European Union has no strategy. Mr. Prodi hit out at the European bloc by demanding that Europe needs to step up its role as an anchor of democracy. What he said next, if it does not want to disappear from the map. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting in light of what we're fixing to study with the Antichrist. Because what's got to happen globally, globally, what has to happen for the world, for superpowers and, <clears throat> and larger nations 
to come under the rule of a one world government, to come under the rule of an antichrist, someone who would have the answers to the problems. There would have to be a crisis. And this crisis becomes the catalyst to begin moving prophetic events in one direction. Because as you're going to see tonight, a lot of things that we're seeing are happening in a month. They're happening in a time period. They're happening in an hour, as we studied last week together. So there's a global cataclysmic event that moves everything toward this direction. Many are speculating right now that Christ could return by Easter of this year. Not so sure about that. I think it's got to line up more with the Feast of Trumpets than Passover, which is going to follow Easter. But whatever the case may be, he can come back anytime he wants. I'm ready. And if you're a believer, uh, I know you are as well. So we won't get too busy caught up in that, even though we live expecting his return every day. Instead, what I believe, this is just my belief, is that everything you're seeing right now is a precursor. It's a forerunner. It's a, a practice run, a trial run of the enemy to see how people and countries are going to respond. And, and of course, what we're seeing now is the church, which is undefeated, the church, which the gates of hell cannot prevail against. The church is making the best out of a bad situation right now. And more people are being reached than before. I read some numbers this week where we're told through different outlets that more people are reaching out for prayer. More people are seeking answers on the Internet. Is this God? Is he returning? More people are returning to the faith. I read one article where in one hospital, five doctors have given their lives to Christ, Christ through Christians who came down with COVID-19 that were sharing the love of Christ with the doctors. And the doctors all of a sudden returned back to their faith and returned back to believing. It's, it's been an amazing adventure so far. And we have great promises given to us from God that no weapon formed against us will prosper and that all things that work together for our good. So we know some good is going to come out of this for all of us, okay? The European Union is saying we're going to fall apart. If this continues, we're going to fall apart. Could this be the catalyst, the setup for a one-world leader to arise? Let's look at the next news article. The Muslim clergy worldwide agrees, and here they are praying at the Kaaba in Mecca. They agree that the Jews, not China, guys, we know it came from China, okay? That the Jews created the coronavirus to shut down Mecca. Because now they can't go pray. Remember that the sacred temple mount is held by the Muslim faith right now. So they're trying to tie everything to the sneaky Jews trying to get their holy site back. Okay, which, anyway, I just thought it was interesting that this lines up with Scripture that Jesus said when we move toward the last days. In Matthew 24 and 9, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations. Jesus is speaking directly here to Jews, not the Gentiles. You will be hated of all nations, for my name's sake. Okay? So, <laughs> we're seeing that happen. This struck me, honestly, it humored me when I read it. If it ain't Jews, it ain't news. Let's blame them for everything, right? All right, next slide. <clears throat> now, we're going to pick up here from, from last week. <clears throat> and we, we looked at our timeline and we saw that the seventh angel had sounded, the seventh trumpet had blown, and the heavens have opened up. And John saw, he saw the, the menorah, he saw the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God. He saw these things. So John now is having another parenthetical vision. One of the reasons a lot of folks get confused about chapter 12, I know it confused me for years, is because I'm reading Revelation chronologically. And now we're at that three and a half year mark. We're halfway through it. We've gone from, from 
tribulation. We're fixing to move into great tribulation. And there's this, this event that kind of happens right in the middle where it's like John spaces out, literally. He spaces out for a second. And what he goes now to see looks very different. So if we could go to the timeline, let's uh, pull that up. If you have yours at home with you, we've now moved from the seventh trumpet over into what we're calling the great actors. There's this time frame that now lies between the first three and a half and the second three and a half years. Okay? Now, the remnant will be saved from this point forward. We're fixing to see that. Prior to this, the remnant that was scattered has been regathered in unbelief, and now some things are fixing to happen. And the remnant is going to be saved, and, and we're seeing several things that begin to move toward destruction. Okay? <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start reading and see what begins to come together for us. Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, <clears throat> travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Now, there are artist renditions of a physical woman appearing, giving birth. <clears throat> There's all kinds of speculation about maybe this is symbolic of something. Uh, we just don't know what it is. Maybe it's the church. Um, and a lot of people come up with a lot of theories. But the Bible gives us the best explanation of itself. So let me take you to Jeremiah 4.31. Jeremiah 4.31. And let's read what Jeremiah prophesied over this. Jeremiah 4 and 31. <clears throat> And we're moving there as quickly as we can. We're stuck? Okay. All right. So Jeremiah 431. It is. It's there. Okay. Good job, Kelly. For I've heard I've heard a voice as a woman in travail, and the anguish of her that brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself. So she spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied. So Jeremiah is saying, We know who this woman is. This woman is Israel. Okay? So Israel, if you look at it again, Israel, let's go back to verse 12. Israel is a woman clothed in the sun okay that's um that's an interesting statement that i'm going to show you in just a moment the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars which we would know as not the 12 disciples but the 12 tribes of israel okay and she's with child you speculate who the child is the child would be Christ, okay? <clears throat> she cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now, let's take another look at this. Let's go to Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. And let's see if there's just a little more proof of this because we don't want to tie our belief up just in one passage, okay? Genesis 37, 9 and 10. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren. This is Joseph. And he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Remember, he was one of the twelve tribes. So he's saying the stars represent the tribes, his brethren. They came and bowed before him. And he told it to his father, to his brethren. His father rebuked him. 
and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to you upon the earth? What Joseph didn't realize at the time, well, they absolutely did. And even all of that, Joseph's dream is symbolic of what we're fixing to see. Remember, the book of Revelation is the conclusion of all prophecy. It is the answer to all visions. It is the completing of everything in the old covenant that was done symbolically is now fulfilled in what we're fixing to see. So what John is seeing is the birth of Israel throughout this vision as we read it. He's seeing the birth of Israel, the coming of Jesus Christ, his death, the gathering of the bride of Christ, and the rapture of the bride of Christ. John, in this parenthetical vision, is seeing something. Hold on. He's seeing something that every Jewish rabbi knows. Unlike in America, where we spend a lot of time on the Internet, a lot of our folks self-medicate with the Bible. When you go to other countries, like especially in Israel, they depend on their rabbis to bring the nation the truth. We're in America. We're very dependent on our government. In Israel, they are still, to this day, a rabbinical-led country. Their pastors, their rabbis, their teachers have direct influence over policy and everything that happens. Where today in America, pastors are looked at almost as a, <clears throat> a leech or a tick, or, my God, I can think of a thousand other things. I don't even tell people I'm a pastor when I go somewhere. I act just like a fella, uh, unless they need a pastor, they do, then I say I'm one. But I have found it to be, I can't even witness to people that they know I'm a preacher. It's almost like if you tell them you're a pastor, the first thing they grab is their billfold. And the second thing they look for is to make sure they know where their wife is. So you just have to be careful. It's not like it used to be where we were honored and respected. But in Israel, very much so still is. <clears throat> so after the rapture of the church, who is Israel still looking to for direction? Their rabbis. Do their rabbis have access to some knowledge from the old covenant that maybe we don't? Hmm. If you're part of Journey Church, you know I teach this. But let, let me just, let me take you back to PowerPoints for a moment. And let me walk you through the steps of something that's written in the book of Job. Now, please understand, the book of Job was actually written before the first five books of the Bible. So Job is the oldest document that we have. Some of the wisdom hidden in Job will absolutely change the way you look at God and the way you look at the earth. So let's move back to the PowerPoint and let me show you something because here's what I believe that John was seeing. In the book of Job, <clears throat> Chapter 38, verses 31, 32, 33. Here's what we read. Can you bind the influence of Pleiades or loosen the bands of Orion? Guess what we're talking about, folks? We're talking about constellations in the sky. You see, what most of us have failed to read into the book of Genesis, chapter 1, about verse 15, is Christ said he set the suns, the moon, the sun, the moon, and the stars in their place in heavens to serve as signs, season, and times. In other words, if this is the earth, circling around us is a clock. As these constellations move, we move in the constellations is more like it. As we move in these constellations, we are moving around God's calendar. And in God's calendar, there are things that, that the Jews know because we... We know that in the book of Job, we're told that God named all the stars. We're also told through the Egyptian history that there was a group of people that came from the east, the wise men from the east. The Egyptians actually recorded them as Sephites, the descendants of Seth. And when you study Genesis, you find out that Seth was that replacement child born after Cain killed Abel and that he and his descendants were called the sons of God. Okay? These men were given knowledge by God <clears throat> over this calendar that was in the sky. 
And remember, this was before satellite TV and news and before any written word. So if you want to do an interesting study, go on Google search and type in Gospel in the Stars or Maseroth. What's interesting is this British pastor wrote and documented a book that is in the Library of Congress and it's called the Maseroth. It's about this thick. Um, I printed up a PDF copy of it because it's not in print anymore. And in this book, he gives you the Hebrew names for all the stars. And wouldn't you know it? There are 12 stars named for each of the tribes. Wouldn't you know it? The, the signs of what we call the constellations, the signs of those tied directly in with what Daddy uh, Israel prophesied over his 12 boys. He called their names. Their names line up with the pictures that we have of the tropic. Okay, it's, it's let me show you. All right, look, the, the Maseroth, these are names that we're familiar with. Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. What we don't always see is like Pisces, the two fish on a chain, for instance. Pisces is the symbol of the tribe of Levi. And there are two harvests, a fish. Who are they? Jews, Gentiles. They're all tied back together with the star that has a name of Messiah. But they're all tied together. And the fish are the harvest. And even the stars in each fish one regulates that it is Jewish in origin and one Gentile in origin. All of these things. So when the Jewish children sat around the fire at night with the elder of their tribe, he would look up and tell them the story because the entire Bible, before it was ever written in paper and ink or parchment and, and ink, it was recorded in the heavens. So every month they would sit and share the stories of God and his return with their kids. It's beautiful. And if I were the devil, which some say I am, but I'm not. If, if I were, the last place I would want you to look would be to the stars. Because then there's no denying what God said. So what's happened in the church? The whole thing about astronomy, about studying the scars, stars has been turned into horoscopes and witchcraft. And my God, we're scared to look to the stars. But yet in Genesis, God put them there before the fall. So we could know the times and the seasons, not the date or the hour, but the time and the season of his return. So what John is fixing to do is go to the calendar. In chapter 12, verse 1, the heavens have opened up, and John is seeing the calendar roll before him. And he's calling out the constellations, and he's calling out the movements. So could it be he's going to tell us what month this stuff's going to happen in? Because all this is connected to a month. Next slide. Let me show you something else. This is the Jewish zodiac. Okay? And Dennis, if you can zoom in on this, you, you can now see that here's the fish. Levi, Zebulon, the ram, Joseph, the ox and horns, Benjamin, the archer. And it goes right around. And there are 12 constellations, 12 tribes. Some are connected. Uh, some are broken apart. Some you see to be vicious looking, some are royal looking, but and, and all of these line up. The inner side is not it's not a clock, it's the 12 months. Okay? It's the 12 months of the year. So if you look to this um this this woman, okay, if you look to this woman, uh her giving birth, Virgo the Virgin, between 12 and 1 and Zebulon. Okay, then what month does that fall in? Well, that's not the kicker in this. The kicker in this is that around this movement, as the earth turns, as we turn around this movement of the stars, the, the stars in the background also form constellations. Okay, let, let me show you. Let me show you. As we move through the clock, let me show you. And you go into it a lot deeper on your own. I just have a few minutes. Let's go to the next slide. Okay? Now, what we're told, so I'm going to pull out two. All right? Let's take a look at these very quickly. We're told that a woman clothed in red, okay, giving birth. Jupiter 
is known as the baby. Jupiter passes through the womb of this woman and pulls back out. So woman clothed with the sun, Jupiter, the child, is in retrograde with the woman's womb for nine months. She lands in here for nine months and moves out. And by the way, guess what month this happens in? Every year. Happens in September. Every year. The moon, our moon, sits under her feet every year in September. Now, clothed in the sun. The sun actually sits right here and lights up her entire head. Okay? And upon her head, 12 stars. This one month out of every year, the 12 stars that make up Leo the lion move right above her head. Right above her head. So there's one month out of every year, according to God's calendar, that all of this stuff lines up and happens. So what John is seeing is a movement that happens in the heavens that you can see with your iPhone or an iPad and you can type in star charts. You can lay it up at night in the heavens, find the North Star, figure in on it, and it will show you what constellations are in the sky if you get a clear shot of the sky. It's one of the coolest things you've ever seen. You, too, can see it happening. Okay? So let's go back to Revelation for a moment, and then we'll come back and we'll look at this dragon, okay, or Draco, all right? <clears throat> And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. As Jupiter passes through during the month of September, the, do you know that most scholars agree that Jesus was not born on December the 25th? I hope you knew that. That chances are because shepherds were abiding in the fields, they weren't feeding them hay in the stalls, that it had to be a month where there was still green grass in the field. And that most scholars agree that it was a September birth of the Messiah. Interesting. Okay? That's another sermon about Christmas. Anyway. Verse 3. And there appears another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Hmm. Let's go to the constellation Draco, if we could for a moment. Because that's in the sky as well. Okay? <clears throat> now, when we see Draco, and, and you can actually pull this slide up on Google Image Search, and just type in Serpent, Revelation 12, and this will pull up. And what you'll see is in the belly of the serpent, where his tail has drawn in. There's actually movement. As the constellations move, you can see this constellation, it appears to gather in the stars of the heavens and draw them into its belly. Okay? It's crazy how it works. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And you'll see that in his head, certain stars in his head bear the name of the deceiver. And above it, the Greeks would call it Hercules, but we would call it the Messiah, okay? You can see where the, the constellation above it appears to draw a club and pop the head. It pops the head of the serpent. The serpent's head passes and the club, they intersect. So all these things where God said, um, he'll bruise your heel. Those two constellations pass. But he'll crush your head. Passes right through. See, these things aren't just something somebody wrote. You can look up in the sky and you can't white them out or erase them. They're right there. Kind of proof of God, don't you think? Kind of proof that this book is true. And if it was true here, it's true here. You got me? Okay? They're undeniable proofs they're just under you've got to live in complete denial of truth to try to escape the truths of this book and the truth of this book is he loves you he doesn't want you to suffer he doesn't want you to go through these things he wants you 
to be delivered. God made you in a perfect world. He made you to live at peace. And he's trying to get us back to that because of the mistake we made. He's trying to get us back to that. Hmm. I hope you can see that, beloved. I hope you can see it. Let's, let's go back to the, to the verse. Chapter 12, verse 4. Because now what we're starting to see is what happened in the beginning when Satan fell. And, and his tail, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. And we're told uh, in the Bible that, that Satan, a third part of the angels of heaven, were deceived by Lucifer. And they went with him. Now, see, that, that's tough for me. It's tough for me because you you got to put this in perspective for a moment, okay? Because you and I have a hard time putting all this in perspective. When you think of Abraham being the father of faith, let's just mull on that for a moment, if we can. Abraham lived in a time and age with no Bible, no church, no praise and worship radio, no preacher, no minister. Let's take it a step further. He lived in an area, let's follow me to the dry erase board, if you can, for a moment. He lived, he lived in a time period. And let's do this. Let's, let's draw out man for a moment. We're going to draw man out as a tripartite being. Body, soul, and spirit. Okay? And you've got to figure where Abraham and everybody in the Old Covenant lived. They lived with their spirit man being devoid of Christ. It was a vessel meant to house, but it was filled with darkness. There was no light. And the soul is where you think, feel, and choose. This is you. And your body is your earth suit. This is what you live in that you're going to leave. So Abraham and all of these people that lived in. Do you know, listen. Um. The one thing we do know about the Holy Ghost and being led by the Spirit. The reason you can be led by the Spirit is because the Spirit lives in you. But when you live in a world where Spirit doesn't live in you, guess what you're led by? You're led by, you're led by what you see, hear, and feel. Which is why everything in the Old Covenant, God would have to appear to a man and say something to him. God couldn't speak to him in here like you hear God speak. They didn't have that ability. Okay? So Abraham was the father of faith because God spoke to him and he chose here to follow God even though in his spirit man he was devoid of the presence of God. He was the, ma he was the father of faith because he had to fight this. Prior to that, he was under the dominion of sin. Paul would call it. He was under the dominion of sin. Every choice that man made, it was, it was pure bestiality. It was men living like animals with sex and murder and anything else they could do, living like the lowest base of God's creation, even though they were not. Does that make sense? Okay, so I just, I, I want to put some clarity in your mind for a moment. As we look because we, we wonder why, but I struggle still. Because this was man's condition. This wasn't the condition of an angel. The angels lived in the heavens with God. They could see, hang out at the throne, listen to the music, eat and drink from the tree of life, what, if they wanted to, whatever. They saw everything that you and I, even though we have Christ now living in us and we are filled with light now we can be led by the spirit but even being led by the spirit with that internal witness we don't see we have to walk by faith and not by sight angels have the sight and they chose not to believe God that shows you how convincing and how deceiving that Satan can be. He's that deceptive. He's cunning, sly, crafty. In fact, when Adam named the serpent, serpent, 
It actually means slithery and deceptive. Because in his created mode, even with legs, he could hide in plain sight and you not see him. Have you ever had that happen to you? A snake in plain sight and you didn't see it until there was some motion or movement or your eyes adjusted and it just, oh! and you run from it. You know, you see one from a distance off, you kind of pace yourself. But when one's just on you, the reaction is usually not calm, is it? Okay? So let's go back to this. Verse 4. He drew in a third part of the stars of heaven. And where did he put them? He cast them to earth. Okay? And the dragon stood before the woman. So we're talking, as these constellations move, as the earth moves, is in all of this motion, in all of this motion, the dragon stands before the woman, ready to be delivered. So the dragon would stand poised in a position in a constellation where the mouth of the serpent is right there where Jupiter passes through to devour her child as soon as it was born. Many trying to put this in chronological order with John's story will try to say this is the 144,000, but it's not. This is not the child. This is not the remnant. This is, this is Christ being born. Remember, John is seeing all of history now portrayed in the constellations. <clears throat> Verse 5. And she brought forth a man child, Jupiter passes through, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God and to his throne. Her child, his throne. Got to be Jesus. Can't be anybody else. That was the ascension of Jesus Christ after his death, burial, and resurrection. This would be his ascension. And the woman, verse 6, And the woman fled to the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now many would say, this is either 1,270 years or three and a half years. Beloved, it's a literal three and a half years. Prophetically, it's 1,270. What if it's both? What if it's not one or the other? What if this is the dispersion after the destruction of the temple for 1,270 years? And what if it is also the three and a half years where the children of Israel are led away by the Spirit in the wilderness, and we go back to the PowerPoint, to a little hidden city outside of Jordan, this little tiny hidden place. This is the constellation with the serpent, the three actors all there together. Okay, go ahead, go to the next slide, please. This little tiny hidden place called Petra. Now, Petra is much larger than this. This is just the Hall of Kings. This is the, 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 the entire city covers, covers a huge, huge area. Only it can be blocked with one tank. You can pull one tank into the entranceway right here and completely block it off to all foot traffic. Okay? Now, obviously not the drones and airplanes and that kind of stuff. However, what you don't see from this picture, go look it up is that the Jordanian government has cleaned, <clears throat> cleared, and refined. Most of these places are motels now. They are resorts and motels. There is water stored there in cisterns. There's food stored there in storage closets. There's enough there. Uh, one, one, one theologian who went, I have yet to go, but one theologian, he sent me back pictures. One theologian told me, he said, Tom, honest to God, from the best of my calculations, there's enough food and water there and there are generators built in it's all buried deep in the rock bomb buster bunker buster bombs can't get to it he said it is buried so deep there is enough there i believe this was his speculation i'm just repeating to feed 144,000 for three and a half years there is a great supply already put there by the jordanian government now you might say Jordan would never let them get there. Sweetheart, you've got to remember what's already happened in the first three and a half years. Look, we're seeing a small amount. We're seeing a percentage and a half of human population die with coronavirus. 
Every year we see almost 4% of human population die from the flu. We've got all these percentages of human beings dying right now that we don't ever see or pay attention to. Coronavirus is the first we paid attention to other than the first SARS or the swine flu, which was a lot larger than this. It's almost like we weren't paying attention. But remember, we've had a meteor hit. We've had ships destroyed, water destroyed, oceans destroyed, animal life destroyed, plant life destroyed. What's to say that all these other governments aren't in just complete chaos and completely out of control by now? And so the Jews just take off those 144,000 head down here and they're sealed in this city. Might be. Might not. I'm telling you, there's a place that looks a whole lot like it could happen. Okay? Let's come back to the, to the verse. The woman fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Three and a half years. Seven. And there was a war in heaven. Now, if you're looking ahead, this has already happened. If you're looking for prophecy, this does line up with what's going to happen in Jerusalem at the final battle. The two can imprint on top of one another. Verse 7, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and fought his angels and prevailed not. In other words, Satan didn't win. Neither was their place found in heaven anymore. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28 verses 11 through 19. And let's read uh, the Old Testament account of this story as told prophetically by Ezekiel to the king of Tyre. Because first he describes a king of Tyre and then Ezekiel kind of changes gears and he goes into a description of Lucifer and what happened. Okay. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, You seal up the sum. You are just like maybe the spirit of Satan has so entered into you that you're acting just like him. Let me tell you what happened to him. You seal up the sum. You're full of wisdom, and you are perfect. You have been in the Eden. We know the king of Tyre had not been in Eden, so he can't be talking about the king of Tyre. You've been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Hmm. The ephod is what's being represented here now. The breastplate of righteousness of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper. Of course, they all represent the tribes now. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee. Oh, look at this. His musical instruments were built in his body. When Satan moved, it was music. Every time he moved, he was a one-man heavenly orchestra. He was the entire band and worship section in heaven. Instruments all in him. What, what one thing did God create to occupy all of man's mind? Music. When you sing, when you hear music and sing, both hemispheres of the brain operate as one. It's the only thing. Which is why you can remember words to a song and you can't remember your phone number. Okay? Because both halves of the brain kick in and the memory works. Which is why we're to greet each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Which is why we put scripture to music to help you remember who you are, who he is, how much he loves you. God invented that. Satan perverted that. He's got his own music too. And you can remember, S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y, if you're from my generation, you can remember all kinds of stuff that you're not supposed to remember because it was in a song. Try to start singing, listen to the right stuff. You can remember that too. Amen? I'm just saying, do with it what you want to. It's right here in the Bible, all right? Uh, next verse. You're the anointed cherub. Satan is a cherub. And I know... Every time we have an artist's rendition of a cherub, 
He's a fat little nine-month-old baby with wings on his back and a bow and arrow. Nah. Cherubs are grown angels. They're not little tiny itty-bitty dots of whatever. They're grown angels. They're pretty big dudes. All the angelic host. They're pretty big dudes. Okay? The anointed cherub that covers. And I have set you so. So you were upon the holy mountain of God. Other words, holy mountain of God is what? Zion. Jerusalem. You walked up and down in the midst. And you were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, they filled the midst of you with violence, and you've sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You've corrupted your wisdom. Think about that. Wisdom being corrupted. Hmm. Fake news. Wisdom being corrupted by reason of your brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. Your heart will... Um, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings. This doesn't mean in a submissive form, guys. I will set you before the kings of the earth that they may look upon you. The kings of the earth will look at all this beauty, all this wisdom, all this. The kings of the world will be enamored by Satan because of his hidden knowledge of the kingdom of God. Remember, we've got one whole cultish movement, one whole cabal that exists in the world right now, a secret society that exists around one thing. They have hidden knowledge other people doesn't have. That's been Satan's cry from the beginning. Hidden knowledge. God's keeping something from you. Let me tell you what it is and you'll follow me. Just put that one away somewhere for a moment. Okay, next verse. You defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities. You have defiled thy sanctuaries. Could he be talking about human bodies? Could he be talking about actual tabernacles, temples, and churches that exist nowadays? Things where worship happened that, hmm, it's not anymore. By the multitude of your sins, by the iniquity of your traffic, the number of people. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Hmm. And in the earth, in sight of all them that behold thee, they'll be destroyed. Now, so what John is seeing is taking us back in time. He's seeing the story of the fall of Satan. Let's read on. Because in Revelation uh, 12, 9, we see the rest of what Ezekiel saw here. We just filled in a blank. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent of the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, so where are we at now on the timeline? I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. For the power of his Messiah, the accuser of our brethren, has been brought down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. So what we've seen now, this woman was given birth. Satan's tried to destroy it. But now Satan has been defeated. Not just by Christ. Christ has taken his place back on the throne in this vision. Now we're seeing Satan defeated by the church. By those who love not their life unto death. Those who followed Christ and didn't care if it cost them their life. And beloved, this is speaking of the, of the 12 elders, the Jews. The Jewish apostles, the Jewish followers of Christ. We, you and I don't come until a little later. In John's vision of what's happened. Remember, it's got to leave Jerusalem and be carried out to the world before we see it. 
Verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great anger, because he knows that he has but a short time. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which would be Israel. Is Israel not the most persecuted nation on the planet now? He persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. We know that was Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. This is interesting because years ago, back in the 80s, an airline was developed by billionaire Jewish people all over the United States. An airline was created called Wings of Eagles. That was the name of this airline. And they would pick up Jews from any country in the world that wanted to come back home and bring them back to Israel for free. Look it up. Google it. It's pretty cool. Okay? Look at this. Into her place. In the wilderness, into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. We know that floods, prophetically speaking, are wars and rumors of wars. The moment Israel was birthed and became a nation in 1948, the moment, within 30 minutes, they were in war for their life. But they'd already been prepared. Prior to forming a nation, God had moved on certain Jewish men and women. They'd already began preparing munitions, putting together um, airplanes, small stuff. But still, they defended themselves and won. Read about the Six-Day War. It really wasn't six days. It was shorter than that. But go back and read the miracle of their survival as a nation. It's the fulfillment of all of this that was said in the stars before the book of Genesis was ever written. God wrote this down long before it ever happened. How could he do that? He's God. And the earth helped the woman. Wow. The earth. What if that, beloved, is a reference to the Americas? Because, let me explain why. Because the Americas are made up of people from all over the earth. So wouldn't it just be fitting that when John saw the earth helping the Israel, I mean, we're known as the big Satan and Israel's known as the little Satan by the Muslims. Israel's called the little America in the Middle East. It's like we walk hand in hand. We're their greatest ally and their greatest help. Could it be that this is referring to us? I don't know. Look at it. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The ally that stops the wars. Hmm. 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Ho! That's speaking of us, the believers. We're the remnant of of the seed. Many want to say here that that remnant is 144,000, yet they've already been pulled aside and sealed. They've already been pulled aside. This remnant that's left, in my opinion, has got to be the church, the bride of Christ. Because of what he says next, this remnant keeps the commandments or the covenants of God. That's, old, that's those living under law. And then it says, and have the testimony the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Whoever this remnant is, they're following the law and they're following Christ. At the same time, sounds like the worldwide church as we know it right now. Isn't that amazing? That, that in chapter, now, it doesn't stop there. His vision of the heavens goes on in the chapter 13, 14, 15, uh, uh, 16, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we get to the final war. Still, you can track all of this in the constellations. 
Go to your buy, go to your, your internet, beloved, while we still have it. Go to your internet, type up, print off things like um, the gospel in the stars or the Maseroth, the story of the Bible in the stars. Type up, print some of these books, buy some of these materials while well, you've got good cue time right now to, to sit and, 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 and read and examine and look for yourself. And uh, let's be prepared. Now, let me change gears real quick. Okay, as we as we end tonight's service, and before I pray for you, I have some very very important announcements. So please don't tune us out yet. Don't turn it off. Um, the first thing I, I want to share with you is Easter is right around the corner, and the truth is we don't exactly know how we're going to do Easter yet. But we got two plans. We've got Plan A that says we're not going to be on a house-by-house house shutdown, okay? That we're not going to be. That's plan A. Plan A says we can still get in our cars and go places just because we want to, whether you get out of it or not. If we do that, then, then Easter Sunday morning, we're going to announce the location to you, but we're going to have a drive-in church service where you don't get out of your car, and we're going to serve you communion car to car. Our care pastors are going to go out and serve communion. Our care pastors will be wearing gloves and hopefully have some sort of mask. And um, just, to, just to be safe and not let anybody think we're being rebellious, okay? We're going to hand it out to you. We'll have a PA system set up. The band will be there doing live praise and worship. And you can sit in your cars and listen. Obviously, those who sit closer to the front are going to hear it better than those who are sitting in the back. Now, that's plan A. Plan B says we're on a house-to-house -house shutdown, which could happen. If it does, please let me give you a couple of uh, pastoral loving reminders. If we go to a house-to-house -house shutdown, these changes normally happen on Monday or Tuesday of each week. Let me go ahead and tell you, be prepared, please. Go by the bank, get some cash. Have some cash on hand. Because what if they shut the internet down? What if so many people get sick that Google can't run their servers anymore? What if something happens and the internet goes down and you can't access your electronic funds? It's just smart. Have some cash set aside, hidden somewhere in case of an emergency, and be prepared. Have plenty of dry goods and dry foods on hand, beans and rice. Always work good. Make sure your prescriptions are refilled for a month or three, whatever you can get. Just be wise. Be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove, okay? Be prepared. But plan B says that we still have internet, but we can't assemble together even in our cars, as some are doing right now. Then we're going to broadcast the entire service over the internet live to you, or it may be recorded, depending on how we're shut down or whatever, or they are or not. And what we'll do is we'll tell you the first of next week to come by the church office. We'll make the communion elements. We got a little pack with wafer and juice in it. We'll set them outside the door in a tub. And you can come by and pick up what you need and go home and just get ready for Easter Sunday service. I'm also going to ask you to do this. Get up Easter Sunday morning. Eat a breakfast. Get dressed for church. Pull up the service on your television screen. If you don't know how, call the church office. Someone here should be able to tell you from what device and how you can get it up on your screen or if it is impossible. If it's impossible, they'll tell you that. Okay? Try to get it where you can view it better. Get dressed up. Get your Bible. Get ready. Because I've got... Listen, God gave me a word beginning yesterday for you for Easter. And it's going to be a good one. Okay, so I'm, I'm asking you, please, let's do this. And the last thing, uh, they kind of go hand in hand. However we do this, guys, if, we're, if, we're, if we can meet in our cars, Pastors Tony and Sherry Martin are going to be there, and they're going to go from car to car and speak to each one of you and give you a chance to love on them and bless them, but you can't touch them. Just love on them and bless them, okay? But Pastors Tony and Sherry are going to be leaving. The 19th of this month is going to be their last day with us they're going to be in cape cod and the 12th is easter sunday 
and I really want to bless them. I hate that it's happened this way. Um, we may wind up having to get a video of them saying goodbye to you. We'll video them here at the church office. And right now, listen, right now you can go to the Journey Church app and go to our giving spot. And we have put in a Tony and Sherry Martin slot on our giving app. Please give them a love offering. We will make sure this money goes to them and we'll put some more with it. Tony and Sherry have been excellent pastors in Journey Church. They have been excellent co-workers with Terry and I. Never have we had a squabble, a fight, a bad word. Never has he created any division, any stir. These guys have been awesome. And we're going to miss them. And Mike and Tanya are going to do a great job of filling their spot. It's hard to beat Mike and Tanya. Uh, Mike and Tanya were trained by Tony and Sherry. Remember that. They're good people too. But it's important that we get our goodbyes said correctly. So we'll be announcing to you next week exactly how that's going to go down. But right now what I really, really need for you to do is please focus on your giving to our church. If you want there to be a journey church when all this is over, you're going to have to make sure you support it now. Many of you are giving electronically. Thank you for that. Many of you are coming by the office. But a lot of you that are cash givers or check givers, you've not come by the office yet. Please go online and give or come by. Come by 9 to 3. Or you know what? You can just come by and slide it through our door and drop it in. The windows are darkened out. Nobody can see the floor. But please, please give to your church. Okay? We need your help and your support. We're going to continue giving you JLA devotions. Terry, Pastor Terry, has been in touch with that crazy woman, Pauline. And she's got her second episode. It's almost ready. Oh, God. Pray for the preacher. She's trying to film at my house in the laundry room. She came by and said she proclaimed our laundry room as her new chapel in Jesus' name. So please pray for the preacher. And follow up, share everything that we have with others. And um, let's have a prayer together, okay? Father, thank you for the bride of Christ. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for the fun that we have. And thank you, Lord. <laughs> there is a great possibility you could return before Easter. If so, I say come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father, I can't think of anything better than to spend the Easter holiday with you <laughs> and my family and my loved ones that have gone ahead. Father, we pray protection over all your children around the world right now. And Father, I speak with Kenneth Copeland and some of these other pastors that stand up and they proclaim this and the world thinks they're crazy, but I don't. Coronavirus, we rebuke you in Jesus' name. Yeah. We have authority over you and anything that is of a pestilence in nature because all pestilences are designed to bring a counterfeit back toward Jesus Christ. And we rebuke you and we demand and command that you miraculously die, dry up, and go away. The children of Israel were not affected by the plagues that were brought on the children of Egypt because they had blood on their doorposts. Father, we have the blood of Jesus Christ all over us. We are covered in the blood. And no weapon formed against us can prosper. So God, we speak life, not death. We speak faith and hope, not gloom and doom. And Lord, the one thing I know is that something good is going to come out of this for the church, for the bride of Jesus Christ. We stand on that. We lift up our president. Our senators, our congressmen, our, our House of Representatives, our governors, our state legislature, our city and council, our local mayor. We lift up our businessmen, Lord, all those that, that, that are looking down the gun of a barrel, a barrel of a gun right now, and they're not sure what to do. Let them be led by the Spirit. God, give them that inner witness that you've got this and it's all going to be okay. Father, we lift up your people and we proclaim... This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen. and amen. Love you. See you Sunday morning, 10 o'clock.